Okay. All right, we'll give it another minute, maybe. All right, well, salam alaikum, everyone. It's great to be with you uh, one more time. This is our last session in Ramadan, and it's the last week of Ramadan, so I hope you're all keeping me in your du'as as well. Um, uh, I'm going to share my screen. So our topic today is theodicy, and this is divine power and human agency. This is the questions of God's power and humans' freedom to choose. So we're going to uh, talk about a number of uh, issues related to this question. But uh, first, let me start with a dua, since at the end this is a halaqa. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا بما ينفعنا ونفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Okay, so um, theodicy and divine power and human agency So we start off by asking the question What is theodicy? Theodicy is an exploration of questions pertaining to God's justice and why evil exists if God is good. Uh, why does God allow good people to suffer and bad people to prosper on earth? Are tragic events such as earthquakes, wars, mass murders of the innocent an indication of a lack of divine justice? Why does God allow these things to happen? So the uh, theodicy is a topic that questions all of these uh, these thoughts that people have in their minds. <clears throat> so there are th uh, several key themes to the discussion of theodicy in Islamic theology. The first is the creation of human acts, and this is known as khalq af'al al-ibad. And when you read texts of theology, particularly early texts, you'll see that this uh, concept uh, comes up often. So خلق أفعال العباد, creation of human acts, uh, does this have an implication on free will? Uh, free will or free choice? What is qada and qadar? Are Muslims fatalists? God's will versus human choice or God's will and human choice? And God's will and God's pleasure. What are the distinctions between these four uh, categories? And then finally, the afterlife and overall justice, the role of judgment, accountability, and punishment in Islamic discussions of theodicy. So these are the different uh, topics that we're going to cover in this, in this discussion today. So we begin with the idea of the creation of human acts, خلق أفعال العباد. So early theologians debated as to whether humans acted, uh, whether humans created their actions themselves when they acted or if God created the act. And the reason this mattered was that this had implications for divine omnipotence. Uh, if humans can create actions that are independent of God, then does that then delimit God's uh, power? Does Do humans then have a power that's independent of God's power? And if that's the case, then how can we say that God is omnipotent? So this was the question that they were asking. Do humans create their acts or does God create the act? If God creates the act, then how does one... Um, how does one explain God judging humans for wrong actions if God created those wrong actions? So this was the, um, the dilemma that uh, early theologians were thinking about and discussing. 
So a common misunderstanding is that this was a discussion between free will versus determinism. This was not a discussion between free will or determinism. It was about the nature of the creation of human acts. So the Maratezilites held that humans had the power to create their own actions. And as I mentioned, this posed a theological problem in which it implies that humans have a power that's independent of God's power. Um, and a common misreading of this is that because Maratezilites held that humans create their own acts, then Maratezilites were for free will and everyone else was for determinism. But it was actually much more sophisticated than that. Ashadis held that humans freely choose their actions, so humans have free choice in their actions, but once these actions are chosen, the act itself is granted by God through his permission or will. So according to Ashadis, humans acquire their actions, or what is known uh, as kesp. So um, you have the intention of turning off a light, you make that intention, you choose that in your mind, and while your finger is on the light or before your hand pulls the plug, it's God that makes it actually happen. This is how the Ashadis explain this. Um, Ashadis argued that God, in giving humans free choice, ikhtiyar, uh, he has done so out of God's will. So in other words, God, God wills that humans have a free choice or free will to choose their actions uh, in the world. So um, the term free will could be uh, misleading in that um, it seems it appears to be an equivalent of divine will. And we're going to look at the distinctions between the two in a little bit. But um, free choice may be a more precise term to use here and that that's a choice that is granted by God. So um, we're saying here, in granting humans free will, it means that humans also have the choice to do evil. And this is the nature of free will. It's not free will if humans can only choose to do good. Um, if God is going to prevent people from doing wrong or from doing less good, then they don't truly have free will. So Maratezilites objected to the saying that um, this is an attribution of evil to God. Uh, Ashadis responded to this saying that humans are free to choose and God empowers human humans through his permission to allow them to choose, i.e. God's will or irada, um, and that God permits humans to do wrong if this is their free choice. But however, evil action is sourced by humans and not God, because the source of that action in that uh, in choosing to do that action is uh, is the human being, and God simply empowers humans to choose between doing right or wrong. Let's look at the free choice of humans and the will of God. So human free choice is under the umbrella of God's will. So if we look at God's will as a broad category, God wills that humans also have a will. But that will is under the limitation of God's will. So um, human free choice is under the umbrella of God's will. So it's not a shared or opposing will. Uh, the difference between human will and God's will is that God's will is independent of any power and is absolute. So God's will is not contingent, whereas human will is contingent. Human will depends on or is contingent upon God. Uh, granting humans the freedom to will, whereas God's will is absolute and does not have anything else that it depends upon. Another difference between human will and God's will is that free will is a human attribute only in the world, whereas um, God is not limited by, uh, by location. 
And uh, finally, God's will is always done. So if God wills that something happens, then it happens. However, this is not the case with human will. So a human may will or choose something, but that doesn't always materialize. So these are some differences here between human will and God's will and why the two are not in, um, in conflict with one another. So human free choice is under the umbrella of God's will. So our next question is, what does it mean for God to decree and ordain something? Are Muslims fatalists? This is another um, trope that um, some have about Muslims, that Muslims are fatalists, that they don't believe that um, things happen in the world out of one's own choice, that you don't have the ability to impact or influence one's uh, what's going to happen in one's life. So let's look at this question and see what does it mean for uh, God to have qada and qadar. So the term qada is God's pre-eternal will in regards to what will be brought into existence in the future, such as God's will to create humans to exist on earth. Qadar is creating all things according to their specified measure. And this is determined uh, by divine will, qada. So God also determines measure. So how long is somebody going to live? Um, uh, diseases that are out of one's control, uh, lifespan, things like this. We might think of these as things that are written in one's genes, right? So if you have certain uh, things that are in one's genes, uh, you know, what, uh, how are you going to be born? What color are you going to be born? Um, uh, what color your eyes are going to be? These are all things of qadar. These are things that are measured and uh, uh, decided uh, in advance by God. So giving humans freedom to choose their actions in the world is a form of God's determination or qadha. So God's decision or God's will that humans have the freedom to choose is also a form of God's determination. So God has determined that humans have free choice, as opposed to God has also determined that angels do not have free choice right? God has also determined that jinn have free choice, that they're able to choose their actions freely. But God has not determined that, say, the mountains or the trees have the same type of free will that humans do. So the uh, granting of free will itself is from qada of God. So um, we're saying here, giving humans the freedom to choose their actions in the world is a form of God's determination or qada. This is what is meant by inshallah. So Muslims will say inshallah. Uh, it does not mean humans do not have the ability to make their own choices. So humans make their own choices, but ultimately those choices are under the umbrella of God's will. Um, believing in God's decree and ordainment does not mean Muslims believe that God coerces them to make cho choices or that they do not have the capacity to choose an act. Those who believe this were a sect known as the Jabriya. And a lot has been written in early Islamic theological um, texts and literature um, in which uh, the Jabriya were really um, debated with, and this was seen as a heretical belief, this idea that God does not give humans the capacity to choose how to act. Um, so Muslims are not fatalists in that Muslims do believe that they have free will, they have free choice, and that God does not predetermine evil actions by people according to Muslim theologians. So the issue with the Jabriya, the most serious uh, theological problem with the Jabriya, this idea that God coerces people to act in good or evil ways, is that um, the Jabriya were saying that God coerces the thief to be a thief. He doesn't have a choice. That's his qada. God coerces the murderer to be a murderer. And then in the, on the day of judgment, the same God who coerced or um, determined that this person would be a bad person 
would will then judge the person uh, as well. So how can God be just if he has predetermined that people will be bad or good and not have uh, and people don't have the ability to choose their actions? Now, let's look at another topic here related to theodicy, and this is God's will versus God's pleasure. I didn't skip something, right? Okay. Um, so Eshari and Maturidi theologians say that God's will to allow human free choice does not mean that God is pleased with all of human choices. So this is a distinction between God's will and God's pleasure. So. Um, this is also known as husn and qub, which is good and evil or right and wrong. So uh, God's will and allowance of people to choose wrong actions does not equate God's pleasure. So rida and irada are two separate uh, things entirely. Martezilites believe that God can only choose good for humans. Therefore, anything that happened was not truly evil, but the best of all po possible wor worlds. So it was aslah. This was the best thing that could have happened. Um, but this poses another problem. Remember Ash'ari's paradox here? So Al-Ash'ari, this is the story of how Ash'ari leaves the Mu'atazilite madhab. Uh, Al-Ash'ari and his uh, stepfather, uh, al Jubba'i was uh, one of the most prominent figures who uh, was one of those who established the Mu'tazilite school of thought. So he, Ash'ari was raised in these gatherings. He knew how to debate in the Mu'tazilite methodology, um, but he had some uh, questions in his mind uh, in his, uh, later in his life. So this is the paradox which Ash'ari is said to have brought to, uh, to al Jubba'i. Uh, regarding this, the concept of aslah. So remember we said aslah is the idea that Mu'tazilites believe that God can only choose good for humans. So whatever happens is the best choice, meaning God does, humans do not have the capacity for, um, to choose evil, uh, that whatever happens to them, God has uh, determined it is the best thing for them, al-aslah. So al-Ash'ari asked Jubba'i this uh, question. This is al-Ash'ari's paradox. He said, what do you say of a believer, an unbeliever, and a child? Uh, Al-Jubba'i replied, the believer is in heaven, the unbeliever is in hell, or the disbeliever is in hell, and the child is in a place of safety. Then an Ashari replied, but what if the child asks God why he did not let him grow up that he might earn a bigger reward? So why is he just somewhere in the middle? Al-Manzila bin Manzila Tain. Al-Jubba'i responded saying, God would say that he knew that if he grew up, he would be a sinner. Then Ashari replied, then wouldn't the disbeliever ask God why he did not allow him to die? so that he would not grow up to be a sinner. And Jubba'i had no answer. So this was, uh, an, this was a contradiction of this idea of aslah that the Mu'tazilites were uh, putting forward. And this has implications to ideas of justice, divine punishment, and accountability. So the nature of humans having free will is that there will always be humans who are going to do evil on earth. Um, humans with free will may often create circumstances of evil on earth. So that's the nature of free will is that people can freely choose to do good or uh, wrong. Uh, God's allowing free will means that God's justice is an overall justice as part of a bigger picture of a temporal worldly life and an eternal next life. So. Um, this world is not the end of things. If this were the end of everything, then the question of, well, how can people can get, do wrong and get away with it would be, um, would not, we would not be able to explain this in that um, truly, uh, if, the, if all of life is what's in this world here in our, 
what in the tangible world, then we would not be able to explain these questions of good and evil. Um, Muslim theologians argue that without hell and without accountability for evil actions on the day of judgment, then yes, there is no justice. And that would be a true statement that people can do wrong in this world and get away with it. Um, this creates a problem of theodicy and that evil people can get away with evil without ever being held accountable. So based on this thinking, the existence of hell and judgment accountability are a manifestation of divine mercy through his justice. So yes, God's mercy overcomes his wrath, but there are times where justice is also a form of mercy. Um, and so, I mean, if you think about it, if you have a mass murderer who is in heaven next to the people that he murdered simply because he's a Muslim or he believes in a certain creed, that wouldn't be justice. That would be injustice. That wouldn't be mercy that God has entered everybody into heaven, regardless of what they've done. So there are some actions that uh, uh, must be that people must have accountability for in order for justice to take place. And that form of justice and accountability is in itself a form of divine mercy. So for heaven to make sense, for free will to make sense, then there must be a hell as a counterpart. Um, Islamic eschatology focuses on judgment based on actions rather than salvation through belief regardless of ethical conduct. So humans are weak, but they are uh, held accountable by God for acting justly, kindly, ethically, honestly on earth. So yes, at the end of the day, Muslims believe that uh, humans will be admitted into paradise through God's mercy, his rahma. However, uh, God also punishes and God also uh, uh, gives justice where it's due, and that that punishment and that giving justice where it's due is in itself also then a form of mercy. And um, I also want to say something about this uh, Islamic eschatology that focuses on judgment rather than salvation. So this also has implications on how Muslims viewed peoples of other faiths. Um, Muslims, Muslims believe that there are certain theological positions that are true. However, they don't believe automatically, they don't know who is going to be in heaven, who is going to be in hell, because ultimately it's based upon God's judgment. Uh, who who enters heaven and who enters hell. And this is different from perhaps Christianity that has a soteriological emphasis as opposed to Islam that has an eschatological em emphasis uh, based upon judgment. So um, uh, we can talk about this uh, further in the Zoom session if you like. Okay, so what about justice and fighting injustice? So the distinction between divine will and pleasure are essential to the permissibility and encouragement to fight injustice and work for the greater good. So just because uh, something is the status quo and uh, Muslims believe that this is the, that everything that happens in the world is happening under the will of God, that it's not against God's will. Uh, everything is happening with the will of God, it doesn't mean that God is pleased with this. And so understanding this distinction helps individuals then to also uh, fight injustices that are in the world. And Sherman Jackson talks about this in his book, Islam and the Problem of Black Suffering. So he brings some Christian theologians who argued that the status quo of, of slavery was an indication that God had willed this for the black people and that their role in life was to be patient and to, uh, to suffer through it. Um, and with time, you had other theologians 
that came up and uh, challenged this perspective. And so what Sherman Jackson does is, well, what would a Islamic perspective of these ideas uh, say about fighting and justice? So I write here, the assumption that divine will was the same as divine pleasure created an attitude that if something is the status quo, then it must be good according to this reasoning, people had to be patient with the will of God. Uh, but this is not the case in mainstream Islamic theology. There is the, there's a distinction there. So humans have free choice. This means they can do evil. God grants humans the freedom to choose to do wrong, but God does not coerce anyone to do good or bad. God's permission does not mean the same thing as God's pleasure. This means fighting a person doing wrong does not mean that one is fighting God's will. This is really important here. So if God's will and God's pleasure are two distinct things, rida and irada are two distinct matters, then fighting injustice does not mean that one is fighting God's will. Finally, God's ultimate justice is in the big picture that takes into consideration an eternal life, an eternal afterlife in which every wrong will be righted. And we also see many references in Islamic scripture to uh, justice and to fixing what's wrong, uh, what's, uh, what has been wrong. So we see references, for example, to the day of judgment. There's a hadith in the meaning of uh, on, the, on the day of judgment, no one who has been wronged will be left without, uh, without getting their due, their rights back. Even the ram who lost his horn because another ram butted it and, and uh, handicapped the ram. So everyone will get their due. These are, this is a hadith to this meaning. Um, and we also see this in the conditions of repentance or tawbah in Islam. So to attain forgiveness for wrongs, there are three conditions to stop the action, to feel genuine remorse, and to have a resolve to never return to this. Unless the action involved another person, in which in this case, then one has to also make an attempt to rectify uh, whatever they've done to the other person. So if they've harmed someone, to rectify this harm is a part of the toba, if they are able to do this. We also see in the Quran references to uh, justice here. Indeed, those who have believed and done righteous deed, indeed, we will not allow to be lost the reward of any who did good deeds. So, inna ladina amanu amilu salihati, inna la nudi'u ajra man ahsana amala. So, uh, nothing people have done of good will be lost in the next life. So, God is promising upon himself that he'll, he will deal justly with human beings. So, indicating for us the principle of justice and the importance of justice uh, in the next life. مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ أَسَاءَ فَعَلَيْهَا وَمَا رَبُّكَ بِظَلَّامِ مِنْ الْعَبِيدِ Whoever does righteousness, it is for his own soul, and whoever does evil, does so against it. And your Lord is not ever unjust to his servants. So uh, the Qur'an explicitly states here that God will never be unjust to any of uh, the human beings. وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُلْكَةِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And let there be arising from you a nation inviting to all that is good, enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong, and those will be successful. Now what's significant here is that the verse is indicating that people have the power to change things around them. It's not saying that God created things the way they are and you have to be patient with uh, what's wrong in the world and uh, put up with it until the day of judgments. That uh, working to right wrongs in this world is actually a Quranic imperative, as we see here, which then also implies theologically that humans have the capacity to right wrongs. They have the capacity to make changes. So it's not, uh, Muslims are not fatalists in that they don't believe that uh, 
everything in the world is the way it is and you just go through life without any ambitions or plans or uh, strategies for uh, for working towards good or for um, a self-improvement that's not what qada and qadar means in uh, in islamic uh, theology we also see the hadiths of the prophet muhammad on working uh, towards justice so uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, said in a hadith, whosoever of you sees an evil, let him change it with his hand. And if he is not able to do so, then let him let it change it with his tongue. And if he is not able to do so, then with his heart. And that is the weakest of faith. So again, this is going back to um, uh, this topic that we discussed here in that uh, if you see something wrong in the world, the assumption that divine will was the same as divine pleasure created an attitude that if something is the status quo, as in American slavery in the 1800s, then it must be good because according to this reasoning, people had to be patient with the will of God. So Islamic theology separates between uh, divine pleasure and divine will. And that distinction is important for one uh, having the capacity to work towards change and still believe in qada and qadar. Uh, uh, we see, so this hadith here indicates that people can make changes. People can make a difference in, their, in the world through action. And if they can't act because say their life is in danger, um, they have circumstances that prevent them from acting uh, externally then do it with their tongue if they can't change with their tongue then at least be against it in one's heart and that that is the weakest of faith um, we also see this hadith here the best form of jihad is to tell a word of truth to an oppressive ruler so again we see this concept of the capacity to act and make changes and that this is not in contradiction with qada and qadash so this is the last slide, folks. We're finishing a little bit early today. We could have a longer discussion, but I think this is all um, a lot to digest. So last question, is gratitude and attitude equal to acceptance or injustice that one has the capacity to change? So yes, the idea, the, the idea that shukur is an essential part of a believer's demeanor and disposition is also uh, there within the Islamic tradition. However, being grateful to God, again, is distinct from uh, seeing a wrong and working against it. So we see this hadith, how wonderful is the case of a believer, there is good for him and everything. And this applies only to a believer. If prosperity attends him, he expresses gratitude to God, and that is good for him. If adversity befalls him, uh, he endures patiently, and that is better for him. So um, we're seeing these are things that people cannot change, say like an illness or a handicap or um, a poverty that one is not able to get out of. And so uh, this a mindset of gratitude actually helps one uh, uh, function in the world and increase in gratitude. So this is another verse from the Quran. If you give thanks, God will increase you in this. And this is, you know, if you look at this from an entirely non-religious perspective, this is an abundance mindset as opposed to a scarcity mindset. So someone with an abundance mindset sees a lot of choices that they have in front of them. And even in situations of hardship, they have... Um, uh, reasons to be grateful. They have, uh, you know, and this is what was popular a few decades back, uh, th this idea of having a gratitude journal, right? So it's it's an attitude that of gratefulness, of shukur. Uh, but again, these are different uh, categories from still having a grateful heart towards God, but still working to fix wrongs in the world when one has the capacity to do so. So these are the end of my slides today. Um, 
I'm happy to take questions and um, have a conversation with all of you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so, so, so much for that. Um, this was, I think, a really nice way to kind of wrap up the first three sessions and um, given us, I know for me, a lot of things to think about. Uh, we do have one question that, that did come up, um, and that is, why did slavery persist in, in the Islamic world? Wasn't slavery seen as an affront to free will decreed by God for humans? How was it justified if there if it was ever connected to theology and was it not, sorry and was not opposed in its light? So um, the existence of slavery was the lesser of the two evils. So you had a world in which uh, slaves were prisoners of war. And the reality was that if you have people fighting with one another, people are captured and uh, those individuals then become enslaved. Uh, it is a serious mistake to equate uh, slavery in the Muslim context with plantation slavery in the United States. So there is no comparison to, I mean, to the savagery of plantation slavery in an American context in any way, shape, or form. I mean, this idea that slavery is inherited from generation to generation, this idea that a slave doesn't have rights, that they cannot buy their own freedom, the idea that they can't eat what the owner eats, all of these are haram within a fiqhi perspective. So just as war is permitted, but as war is permitted, there are really strict guidelines for what is uh, permitted uh, in ethical warfare for Muslims. The same thing in um, slavery is not an ideal situation for anybody, but um, there are strict guidelines if, uh, this, if there is a situation where um, individuals, uh, where this is a reality uh, in the pre-modern period in which um, slaves were prisoners of war, then um, there are strict rules as to how, uh, how that can take place. Um, if you want to read on this, Jonathan Brown actually wrote a book on this. And, you know, a lot of people have criticized the book without reading it. So I encourage you to read it. This is a scholarly um, study and discussion of how, how was slavery uh, practiced in pre-modern Muslim times, and how is it different from plantation slavery? Thank you for that answer. Um, and if anybody else has any questions, feel free to either drop them in the chat or just unmute yourself and, and chime in. We're a nice small group today, so um, plenty of space to uh, propose your questions and hopefully get some answers. Um, I, I did have not so much a question, but maybe just as I'm listening to you explain these things, these concepts, I couldn't help but go back to the story of Musa alayhi salam and Khidr. And are there, was that story, those parables, par, parables um, were they were, were connected to free will, free choice? And of course, it's always that story of Khidr murdering the little boy. Um, and again, I'm sort of thinking out loud here, but you know, how, was that sort of, um, mirroring how God sometimes does things that are very difficult. Should we have thanks? Kind of how you sort of wrapped it up. Are there, are there any connections to that? Well, the Khidr story is much more about teaching Musa a lesson rather than a story of free will and determinism because, you know, Khidr, some will say he exists, but, you know, you're not going, you're, I'm not Khidr, you're not Khidr. People, normal people don't have the uh, knowledge of the Ladunni knowledge of Khidr and they don't have the capacity to uh, break rules and do things that would otherwise be um, uh, unfathomable. So the story of Khidr and Musa is really much more, it's much more related to um, teaching Musa a lesson of humility. So he's a prophet and he is, he's spoken to God and yet, despite his uh, status as being a prophet and a messenger and uh, being one who God spoke to, he still doesn't know everything. And so this is a lesson to us that no matter 
how much we might learn, no matter how much we might study, no matter what our rank might be, that there's always somebody who knows more than us. Oops, thank you for that. And I, and I might add, if, if there's always somebody who knows more than us, then everybody with the little bit that they know can teach others and help others and benefit others with, with what they know based on their own limited knowledge. If we all um, waited to be um, to know everything, then we're going to get to the end of our lives to realize it's not possible to be a scholar that knows everything about anything. And then you spent you lost a whole lifetime in which we could have uh, benefited others and helped others learn. Such a great point, such a great, and I will say, um, I think that's one thing that is sort of maybe unique with the Muslim space community is that we encourage anyone to come and share what knowledge you have, what experience you have, because even if it's less in some than the person next to you, it's sure different. And you were able to contribute uh, anyway, no matter what, that, that's wonderful. Um, I do have another question, totally off topic, but I figure as we have you here, um, it's been such a treat these last four weeks, um, you know, for you to come in here to Muslim space and share your knowledge, your wealth of knowledge um, in a way that, I mean, we're talking, you've opened the door into a world that the average person, believer, you know, Muslim, non-Muslim just doesn't really get to enter. You've shared with us history of discourse and debate and evolution of thought, uh, you know, where a lot of times we sort of feel like, you know, Islam came and it's been static and it's had very little change over 1400 years. And you've, you've displayed that it, that is absolutely not the case, that there is a lot of room for a discourse and um, discussion and thought and reasoning and logic and applying all of those things. So my question to you is, how did you get to where you are? How, you know, you oh. are, and I, and, I, and I ask this because, I mean, the honest is, the honest fact is you are, as a woman, you're not often, um, we don't see this enough. We don't see women of your caliber um, speaking to the community on these topics that are relevant for everybody. Um, and, and it's truly an inspiration uh, for for all of us, men and women, young and old. So I would love if you could just take a few moments and share with us sort of your path to to how you got to where you are in this, mashallah, amazing place. Yeah, well, thanks for that question. Um, you know, I still have a lot of work to do. I have a lot to learn. So I'm not um, anywhere near where I'd like to be. Um, <clears throat> but um I've had the opportunity to learn and study from other women who have been role models to me. And so um, when I was in high school, my father was working for a US company based in Texas that had a project in Syria. And so I spent five years of my teenage life from 12 to 17 in Damascus. And um, during my time in Damascus, I was exposed to women's scholarship, women who really were immersed in their knowledge of theology and Quran and Hadith and Tasawwuf and um, every aspect of Islam, Islamic history. And so, um, you know, I didn't come from a very religious family at the time. Um, seeing that modeled for me really shaped my own perspective of what women can do. And so um, my first experiences of Islamic scholarship were always with Muslim women scholars. My first prayers in Jama'a were always with women and with Muslim women leaders. And so just always having had that in my life um, helped me feel that as a Muslim woman, I can do anything and I have the capacity to learn and study and uh, be able to comment on topics just as anyone else could. Um, so I think that this is so really important for our younger generations of Muslim women today, especially I think in American contexts where they don't see a lot of uh, Muslim women scholars as role models that they could look up to and that they could 
uh, feel that they could um, follow in their footsteps in learning and study and all of this. So um, I uh, always continued my traditional Islamic studies on the side from 1994 all the way until the war started in Damascus. And after that, I've been studying in the Ottoman curriculum in Istanbul, um, different texts within the Ottoman curriculum, including theology actually. Um, and I started, I did a PhD, I did a master's degree first at the University of Chicago, and then I did a PhD at the University of Chicago. So that's the second um, part of my um, formation as a scholar that I really owe, uh, I really owe to is the University of Chicago has, um, I would say just, I would say the best, but it's known to have one of the top five Islamic studies programs in the in the country. And um, just the rigor of study, the library, the extensiveness of the library, where I spent a decade of my life in that library, where any book you want is available in any language, and you meet all sorts of knowledgeable, smart people and have conversations in the Regenstein Library of the University of Chicago. You know, uh, both of these really helped uh, uh, me in my formation as a scholar. So being able to have the suhbah, the good company, the mentorship, the modeling of Islamic scholarship in uh uh, Muslim women that I've had the opportunity to learn from, as well as the rigorous, uh, very rigorous academic study um, that I was exposed to during my uh, PhD studies at the University of Chicago. So, um, so that's my story. And what a great story that is. Thank you for sharing that. And I love that um, you, you really hit it um, in that being around women scholars gave you that confidence in yourself, that that experience that you had, because I think that's a lot of times what we're lacking, you know, especially for girls, that we don't have the confidence. Girls don't have the confidence to just go, I can do this because, because I can, you know, there's no limitations to what I can accomplish. So I just love that it's so beautiful and it's so important that we should always try to just kind of push, push both the girls and the boys, but especially the girls in fields that they're not often made room to, to belong to, that to say, yes, you can, yes, you do belong there. Um, and I love that all of those pieces came together to, to take you where you are. And now you're at the Islamic, uh, no, the American Islamic College in Chicago. Yes, yes, that's where I teach right now. Fabulous. Can, now you do have a trip coming up to Turkey. And I think I saw this, that it's, um, it's a, kind of a big deal. It's like two, almost two weeks maybe. Oh, so yes, I've been leading some learning tours. In March, I led a learning tour to Uzbekistan and we had 45 attendees and um, it was a great, wonderful trip. Uh, we looked at Islamic history and we focused on the Kufan tradition of reading texts uh, rationally or reading texts. You know, when I say liberally, people don't understand quite what that means, but this the Ahlul Hadith, Ahlul Ra'i. This, uh, this was a distinction from early Islamic uh, history. And how do you read text? Do you read it literally? Do you read it um, for the broader meaning? And um, we have this um, narrative, this Hadith that's often brought up in this conversation. Uh, you probably know the story in which the Sahaba said, do not, the Prophet told the Sahaba, don't pray Asr until you reach Banu Quraiza. Asr time came in, they were about to miss it. And then there was a group of them who said, the Prophet meant, don't be late, we're not going to miss Asr. And then there were the others who said, no, the Prophet said, don't pray Asr until you reach Banu Quraiza. We're going to take his statement outwardly, literally. And so these were two different ways of understanding the prophet's words. And when these two groups came to the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, he did not correct one group over the other. He didn't say, you guys were right, you guys were wrong, indicating that there are many ways of interpreting and many ways of um, understanding um, uh, how to uh, practice our faith in the most true way. Uh, you know, and so the theme of this group was, you know, which group would you have been in? Well, which group would you have been in, Shadia? You don't have to answer if you don't. 
Would you I, I have would, prayed or not prayed? I would have prayed. I would. Have okay. Prayed. So the people who would have prayed, we might say, would be an allusion to the people of Kufa, because Ahlul Ra'i and the way of thinking that evolves in Kufa were, was very much in line with the group of Sahaba who prayed. And Kufa really uh, becomes a city of the Sahaba. It's it starts with Omar ibn al-Khattab. He sends his, the, one of the closest companions of the Prophet Abdullah ibn Mas'ud becomes the teacher, the chaplain, the mentor of the people of Kufa. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was, he served the Prophet. He lived with the Prophet. He, was, he used to enter the Prophet's home. So he knew the way the Prophet was. He didn't just take some hadiths and interpret it literally. So Omar ibn al-Khattab and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud had um, that was their approach. So they were the approach of the group of people who would have prayed. And they established their school in Kufa, which is a newly established Muslim city. Um, then when Sayyidina Ali makes Kufa his capital, you have by the time of Ali, best of the bo both worlds, you have Omar's school of thinking and Ali's school come together and you have about 1500 Sahaba that settle in the city of Kufa. So the city of Kufa, you know, we often talk about Amal Ahl al Medina, but we forget about Amal Ahl al Kufa. We forget that the spirit of Kufa, of being able to think quickly and being able to apply Islam differently in different circumstances, is very much a part of the earliest practice of Islam. It's not something that people came up with later because they were influenced by. Um, Western culture, whatever some uh, you know, some thinkers in the uh, modern era have have argued. But this way of understanding Islamic practice as dynamic, as always, uh, as flexible, was something that was always there from the beginning, and it's very much uh, um, rooted in the Sahaba who link themselves back to the Prophet. Um, as opposed to Kufa, you have the people of Medina. Now, the difference between Kufa and Medina, Kufa is a heterogeneous uh, city. Kufa is diverse. Kufa has different tribes. Kufa is in Iraq, where you have different religions coming through. You have trade coming through. You have all of these different people coming through. And if you're going to be Muslim in this diverse environment, you've got to be able to think on your feet. You've got to be able to know how to practice what was the spirit of the Prophet Muhammad's teachings and how can you apply it in these very different circumstances, as opposed to Medina, which was homogenous and, um, you know, uh, the Sahaba were not, they did not, uh, much of the Sahaba stayed in Medina after the Prophet Muhammad passed away. And uh, a lot of the environment of the time of the Prophet remained in Medina for a long time. And so uh, somebody who is living in that environment of hom hom that's hom homogenous, that, uh, you know, you're friend, his grandfather was the Sahaba. I mean, this is a ideal environment that most people will not be able to be in, but their way of interpreting will be different. So you see Ibn Omar and Omar have two completely different ways of interpreting hadiths of the Prophet. So Omar ibn al-Khattab's son, Abdullah ibn Omar, used to interpret things literally from their outward meaning. The Prophet Muhammad prayed two rak'ahs under this tree while he was on a journey, Abdullah bin Omar would do the same because he saw the Prophet do it. So that was his way of understanding things. But Omar ibn al-Khattab was different. Abdullah bin Mas'ud were different. They would have been with the group who would have prayed. So they settled in Kufa. And then Kufa becomes one of the most influential cities because all of these individuals migrate eastwards on the Silk Road. So one of the places that they migrate is to Bukhara and Samarkand. And that's what our trip really focused on was this um, way of thinking, what would you have done if you were in this situation? Let's look at how theology developed in Samarkand and Hanafi fiqh evolved in Bukhara and how tasawwuf became uh, really developed in Bukhara, how all six of the kutub as sitta, not one of them is in the Arab world. They're all in either Khurasan or Mawara and Nahar. So Imam Bukhari is in Samarkand. Imam Muslim was from Bukhara. He's buried, I believe, in Nishapur. Um, 
I have to check on that. Imam Tirmidhi is in Uzbekistan. So you see, I mean, this is a land. What was what distinguished this land that uh, enabled all of these great scholars from hadith to theology to tasawwuf to fiqh to philosophy to come from this area? So it was very much an exciting study tour and a learning tour. And I think that um, the participants came out of it really motivated and excited. This summer, I'm leading another trip called Eastern Anatolia Immersion. And um, we're going to the, uh, we're going off the beaten path. So we're going to some of these cities that um, most Western tourists don't go to. Um, so we're going to um, Ant Antakya, Gaziantep, Diyarbakir, Shanlı Urfa, and Mardin. And we're going to uh, be going, it's a nine day trip. Uh, tenth day, we'll be flying back to Istanbul, but it's a nine day trip. And um, uh, let's see how this goes. I think this will be uh, a lot of fun too, because it's Northern Mesopotamia, that region. So there's a ton of history there too. You have uh, different uh, churches. You have the, um, remember we talked about the monophysites and the diaphysites. You have the two forms of uh, Christianity at the oldest monasteries and churches there to this day. You have um, in Diyarbakir, you see uh, there's this 27 Sahaba that are buried there. And it's interesting to consider how Assam spread into those regions. You have, um, you have, uh, they, it's said that uh, Ibrahim, Prophet Ibrahim was born in Urfa. So we're going to visit those places as well. And um, there's great food there. So I think it'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I think you sold everybody on the food. You got to yeah. that, you know, was the, <laughs> that sounds like that's a, that sounds like a great trip. I, I have to say, I really like that litmus test of uh, which which would you have prayed Asr there? Or would you have waited? I like that. I might bring that up with the family uh, iftar tonight just to see how people yeah. would answer that. Yeah, because I a lot of people never think about this for themselves. Well, which group would you have been in? And that reflects a lot about you and your personality and your way of thinking. And it's okay if um, you have another friend who may have been with the group who prayed or didn't pray because that's not your, <laughs> that's their way of thinking about things. And we're comfortable with those differences. Right. You know, I think a problem I see in the Muslim community is that we're not comfortable with differences. We're not comfortable with multiple ways of interpretation. And um, that comes, I think, from a lack of knowledge, a lack of rootedness and knowledge, as well as a lack of confidence that comes with a lack of rootedness and knowledge. There's that confidence again. I can agree with you more. And, and I know that's something that, that on the side I've had discussions with um, you know, peers and friends is having that confidence in your own faith and your expression of faith and your understanding and, and your studying to determine what, um, what, what jives with you. I, and I'll tell you from per personally, as I'm, you know, listening to these, these lectures, you will oftentimes bring up two sides and I'm going, oh, that's more like me. I definitely agree with that more. I don't really agree with this. And I am trying to determine sort of what label can I apply to myself um, or which, which um, thought, which, which trajectory, you know, do I connect with more? And I think that that is so important. We're just not often given those, those opportunities to think like that. You know, it's sort of like, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, what do you... Um, what do you think? You know, a lot of times thought, your own personal thought, reason, logic is not invited into determining how to uh, behave religiously, how to express, how to understand. So again, thank you so much, so much for that. Um, any last questions? I mean, you know, we have Dr. Uh, Ferial for just a couple more minutes, if there are any questions. If not, I do. Oh, I think Ryan has a question. Ryan, jump on in. Ah, Salaam Alaikum. And thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. It's been very fast. I mean, this has been excellent. Thank you. Um, you have to forgive me. This is kind of an off the cuff question because mentioning Turkey. Um, a couple of years ago, I actually attended a study session with a local Turkish Sufi group. And they were basically reading primarily from Said Nursi. And I'm kind of curious um, how prevalent is kind of like his works and everything or get kind of reference because it was like the first time I've actually 
encountered his, which I think basically it was the um, Risale Inur. But I'm just given theolog theological circles near that you're in and everything, is it prevalent or referenced, I would ask? Yeah, so um, Risale Inur Nursi is definitely prevalent among some circles. Uh, I personally haven't uh, read uh, Risale Inur extensively, so I'm not knowledgeable about that outside of um, the general subject. Um, Said Nursi was, uh, he, he was, he came up during a time in which there was a lot of atheism. There was uh, a lot of um, doubt that people had. And this idea that science challenged religion was also prevalent. And so he really wrote uh, in a language that responded to these ideas um, in, in Turkey. Um, and I, over time, I know that people have uh, read his books outside of Turkey and it's become a global, um, a globally read uh, uh, series of books, a series of letters or treatises by uh, Badoui Zaman Said Nursi. Um, he is more of a modern theologian. So remember in the first lecture, we talked about how there were many issues that arose with modernity that Muslims were responding to. So he's one of those individuals who responded to problems of his time. Um, yeah, I, I hope that's helpful. I'm not really an expert on uh, Nursi or his, uh, uh, his uh, writings. So that's as much I, as I can tell you. Oh, thank you. Actually, this in the context, it makes sense and everything, because in the time during these lectures, there was um, discussions on the Kalam cosmological argument, yeah. um, everything basically rating, and, and as you basically said, for modernity and everything, because um, there was a lot of more recent scientific concepts basically brought into place and everything, more of the position of the Earth within the um, solar system itself and everything within a certain um goldilocks zone i guess as people would basically put it so as you state that actually makes quite a bit of sense so thank you yeah you're welcome all right we do have another question that came in um and the question is so in the first lecture you mentioned that descartes created a new framework that was different from the aristotelian model that islamic theologians worked with for one uh, uneducated in philosophy, could you explain this change a little further? Um, we talked about the Cartesian models of thought, didn't we? Um, I believe it was, and I was talking about this in reference to uh, this idea that everything is limited to what you can touch, feel, and sense, and that there is nothing beyond the what is empirical. Right, and so before that, people uh, discuss other forms of existences. So, like you know, the forms were you have a chair, but the chair also has a form in some unseen world that is a form of that of the actual physical. So, Cartesian models of thought then made everything that exists, every a mode of discourse based upon what is empirical, what you can see, touch, and feel. So in a nutshell, um, uh, those are the two distinctions there. Thank you. I hope hopefully that answered the question. All right, one last question, and that is, um, where can we follow your work? So what's the best way? Uh, YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook, what's the best way to sort of get tidbits of what you're working on. Yeah, so you can follow me on Instagram and I am working on developing a website where I put some of my short written blogs and ideas on there. Um, like for example, the significance of pomegranates in Islamic culture and across borders and ac across geographies, things like that. So. Um, once it's up, I will share it. It's still under construction, uh, but you are free to follow me on Instagram. And um, I hope that I will have more things uh, in the works. Uh, so our learning tours, we will have videos uh, coming out. 
but that takes time to work on. So um, all of those will come up, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. That's great. So, okay, guys, um, follow on Instagram and inshallah that website, when that comes up, do share the link with us and we will um, eagerly share it with our community. So again, Dr. Freya, I cannot thank you enough um, for this for this series. Uh, it was truly, truly, truly beneficial um, for us. And I know that once Ramadan is over, I'm going to go back when I have more clarity uh, to yeah. process these these topics to rewatch the videos. So um, we thank you so much, and I wish you a very, very, very blessed final week or so of Ramadan and in happy Eid, inshallah. And we hope to bring you back here to Muslim space sometime soon. Inshallah, inshallah. And thank you for your generosity and inviting me. This has really, uh, it's really been fun to do this. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Inshallah. Okay, everybody take care. Um, we will be back for, you know, we've got more events coming up, but inshallah, hope everybody has a great last week of Ramadan and we'll see you all soon. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum.